Um, and I will introduce our final speaker for this panel, Casey Kaliba, who joins us from the University of Mary Washington in Virginia, and is going to talk to us about the white arm in the smoke, performances of masculinity and violence in Victorian London. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, my paper is sort of in conversation with a number of papers that have been presented today, and uh, I'd very much like to rewrite all of it now. Um, but I want to sort of tag into what Broderick brought up in this idea of sort of um, theater and physical culture being in opposition. Uh, I'm primarily a, a, a fight director by profession, and I teach stage combat uh, academically. And so I'm really interested uh, in, in the intersection of theory and practice, uh, but also in the sort of patterns that show up in the classroom and then get reified and replicated in, the, in rehearsal and performance, um, and sort of looking at the why of all of that. So, a bit of a story. Mm -hmm. On the night of August 4th, 1895, at the fashionable Queen's Hotel close by the Crystal Palace, the newly knighted Henry Irving enjoyed an evening celebration of his recent honor. The actor provided amusing anecdotes and after dinner gave recitations, including Thomas Hood's The Dream of Eugene Aram. According to the minutes of the evening, the hotel party broke up at 11.20 and reassembled at Irving's lodging in Grafton Street until an early hour of the morning. His hosts that night were the Kernuser Club, founded in 1881 as a gentleman's club of arms and armor antiquarians, and the name is a colloquial derivation of connoisseur. The club's members included a cross-section of privileged Victorian masculinity. Artists Seymour Lucas and Robert Hillingford of the Royal Academy, celebrated antiquarian the Baron de Cassan, Captain Alfred Hutton of the King's Dragoons, popular romance author and noted sword historian Edgerton Castle, the translator, journalist, and medievalist Wentworth Huish, Walter Withell, executor of Mary Shelley's Will, Oxford Law Professor Sir Frederick Pollock, and his brother Walter, who was editor of the Saturday Review and translator of Diderot's Paradox of the Actor, as well as the explorer Sir Richard Burton, translator of Arabian Nights and the Kama Sutra. A small and socially elitist organization, the Kernusers represented a disproportionately powerful intersection of art and culture with widespread and enduring influence. Now, I teach in and was trained by an American educational system that has very little interest in Victorian theater. Uh, we like our naturalism French, we like our realism Scandinavian, and we are very happy to ignore English theater between Congreve and Weill. Uh, so there's no reason for this dinner party to become anything more than a footnote of a footnote. But the party was a high watermark of modernist revolution in the image, depiction, and experience of the martial male body on the Victorian stage. And the echoes of this corporeal identity crisis can still be seen in actor training and stage practice today worldwide. So let's look at what brought us to the rebels of 1895. Irving had been associated with the Kernuser since at least 1893, when he was voted an honorary member. During the year of his knighthood, Edgerton Castle staged the fights for Irving's production of Romeo and Juliet at the Lyceum. At 58, he must have been a spry Romeo, and the combat was featured heavily in illustrated and published reviews. What was particularly noteworthy about the staged fights, and why Irving had sought out Castle to arrange them, is that they were presented in a wholly novel way. They were historically accurate. And I want to be very clear that this really was the first time that this had been done. There's been a lot of uh, discussion about Shakespeare's fights being historically accurate, uh, and there is zero evidence whatsoever to support that. Um, staged fights in the 18th century really were uh, recreating contemporary stage fighting of the time. So Garrick playing uh, Richard III is doing foil fencing at the Battle of Bosworth Field. And we do have image evidence of that production. The Kernusers were cultural historians, and their theatrical work was part of a movement that went back to McCready, and which emphasized accuracy in the scenery, dress, and material objects of stage productions. This culminated in the work of the Kernusers, who brought together historically and culturally correct objects with a corresponding accuracy in movement neither of which had been aesthetic values in representation or practice until the late 19th century. Through this emphasis on cultural and historical embodiment, as well as the colonial fascination with material goods as cultural artifacts, the Kernusers invaded the public sphere with the spectacle of the armed male body in action. They designed and produced theater costumes and choreography, published editorials and reviews, created illustrations and historical paintings, adventure novels, military manuals and public lectures, mass entertainment de demonstrations of historical combat, all of which used the material objects of martial culture to code the image of the true and virile English man as honorable, victorious, and natural, able to inflict itself outward. 
And I want to be clear that I'm not defending or attempting to essentialize or naturalize this image of violent hypermasculinity. On the contrary, what I'm trying to do in my work and also in my classroom is identify its origins, its origins in order to define those outlines so as to remove a sense of ideological inevitability. And I do not want to impose intentionality here. There's no evidence that this is what, uh, that there was any kind of ideological campaign or a conscious intervention on the part of the producers. But the outcome of hundreds of individual actions, performances, or artworks is a fairly cohesive depiction of a new male body, defined by its relationship to combat and the sword, modeled by the members of the club through literature, stage production, athletic coaching, popular painting, academic lecture, demonstration, and exhibition. Central to the success of this multimedia output is a sense of kinesthesia in the audience, a mirrored physical identification and embodied replication. We ought to avoid a purely logocentric reading of these images as cultural texts. The Carnusers were mapping the ideology onto the corporeal, to be sure, but they were also basing that ideology on the possibilities inherent in the physical reality of the male body, which could be learned and experienced by an audience. Building this identification into the emotionally heightened spectacle of athletic performative violence creates a feedback loop of identification and embodiment. The visual, narrative, and performative work of the Carnusers fit into a gap created by three specific events that had decentralized and destabilized the meaning and power of the male body. The first were a series of cholera outbreaks, starting in the 1830s, which triggered revolutions in public health management, but also helped spur national, institutional, and individual interest in physical fitness, aerobic activity, and sport. The second were the catastrophic casualties of the Crimean War, the militarized male body has always been a palimpsest for paternalistic and nationalistic honor, sacrifice, and ability, but these ideals were no match for the realities of disease, poor care, and the classless indifference of modern mechanized warfare. Um, the Crimean War and the American Civil War a decade later were the first wars that featured weapons that could literally vaporize a human body. Um, and just to be clear, that's literally turned the body into vapor with the destructive power of the weapon. The crisis of masculinity following the Crimean War was a crisis of corporeal ideology. The real male body failed to provide what the imagined male body demanded. Finally, the Carnusers were the first generation to come of age in an England without dueling or trials by combat, which had been finally and permanently, permanently outlawed by 1852. The economies of social behavior and violence the codes of honor had regulated were taken over by the panopticon of the state stripping the male body of its central place in systems of justice and honor. So when in 1895, Oscar Wilde and the Lord Queensbury, author of the boxing rules which still bear his name, resolved their dispute in court rather than a ring, the transition from manly challenge to legal recourse was essentially complete. And that's not to say nobody ever fights anyone anymore. You know, we don't satisfy anything by fighting. But fighting is a poor alternative to court today, rather than court being an insufficient alternative to a challenge. And certainly these three, uh, the cholera epidemics, the Crimean War, and the, the dissolution of dueling, are not the only three forces we would examine, but they're very relevant to the imagery of violence and martial ability. We could also look at the, the, the relationship of the male body to industrialization, uh, the sort of political influence of the male body uh, compared to female suffrage, um, and the sort of shift of class and status as sport and leisure start to creep in uh, in the 19th century and are changed over the 19th and early 20th century. But the Carnusers were part of a generation that was renegotiating the value of the politically idealized male body as an intersection of individual, civic, and moral identity. Men were changing their own bodies through a revolution in sport culture to conform and perform the new changing ideal. Against this, the long shadows of internal and intellectual artists like Ibsen and Stanislavski have obscured the revolution in physical culture that marked theatrical modernism in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. The political charge of naturalist writers and the internalization of acting after Archer, Antoine, and Stanislavski are antithetical to the conservative politics and aesthetics of the antiquarians, historical painters, romance writers, and medievalists of the Carnuser Club. But the centrality of the body in fin de siècle performance was part of a larger international theatrical movement towards corporeality. And if the tone of avant-garde artwork was intellectual, the subject was repeatedly physical. Boxing, wrestling, rugby, fencing, shooting, football, cycling, track and field became familiar artistic subjects. And this emphasis on physical spectacle was an essential part of Victorian and an Edwardian spectacle performance. 
The strongly nationalistic ideology embodied in the Kernuser's performances, paintings, and publications, the image of the strong, patriotic, dominant male figure, is at odds with the content of the new social drama. So the place of the body in modern theater training or history has often been obscured, ignored, or we've used modern, modern dance as our point of reference instead. Part of this modernist fascination with the male body and performed combat, and the variety and scale of these performances, was embodiment and aestheticization of nationalism. French physical culture had been a response to the Franco-Prussian War of 1871-72, and German athletics grew out of memories of defeat in the Napoleonic Wars a century earlier. For the French, this led to the founding of the Olympics. For the Germans, the recruitment of their military officer corps from university fencing clubs. The English were responding to the overlap of their own physical and national perceived weaknesses, exposed by the cholera outbreaks and the casualties of the Crimean War, as well as a romantic sense at the turn of the century that something heroic and manly had been lost amongst the decadents, and that there was a real moral and national danger if it were not recovered. In England, Austria, and the United States, this simultaneously led to the formation of forward-looking military organizations for young boys that stressed national defense, physical ability, and survival skills. Lord Baden-Powell's creation of the Boy Scouts in 1908 was a parallel to the Kernuser's part in the ideological reconstruction of the meaning of the male body. Patriotic, militant, capable, always prepared. The Kernuser's presented a direct link between the exhibition and practice of historical martial traditions that would entwine physical, moral, and national health. Necessary to this preparation and need for martial skill was the constant implication of threat. A narration of isolation and danger surrounded Victorian gentlemen. He was depicted as besieged at home by psychopathic ruffians, inferior foreigners, and increasingly organized crim criminal networks. Uh, and magazines of the time uh, offered sort of snapshot explanations to how to defend yourself against a variety of situations. Um, they advertised iron collars that you would wear on the streets of London to prevent yourself from being garroted. Uh, there was defenses against an attack by necktie. Uh, and my personal favorite was a series of diagrams about how to defend yourself with a bicycle. <laughs> um, I, I wish I'd had the PowerPoint of that. Um, but well before the guns of August fired, milita fired, military fiction novels were exploring the possibility of continental war, adding to a speculative paranoia and an emphasis on the need for martial embodiment. This centrality of corporeality shows in novels like Wells' The War of the Worlds, which didn't pit alien technology against mankind so much as it contrasted the strengths and weaknesses of bodies themselves. There was a substantial change in the representation of the male body through martial performance in the second half of the 19th century, building towards the work of the Kernusers. And there's a question to ask about whether an insecurity or revision in masculine identity over that time required the invention of an external threat, or whether there was a genuine fear that inspired the need for a new image of the body, or what the intersection between those two ideas is. To explore that question, I'd like to make two final points about the lasting legacy of the Kernusers, their relationship to modern stage combat, and the unlikely place of this defiant body in modern American politics. The Kernusers were not alone, and they did not invent the art of fight direction, but they were instrumental in setting up the intellectual and semiotic framework that we still use. What the Kernusers and their successors did was to alter patterns of performance, so that the embodied and material signs of a fight scene took on new and specific cultural meanings. By emphasizing the practical and historical references of stage fights, they shifted, shifted the emphasis from the sign to the signified. The Kernusers created a model by which the signs of violence were stabilized to a historically right that imposes a corresponding but artificial correctness in the way we train actors, rehearse them, and then experience that work as audience members. So prior to this time, um, as uh, Erica fischer Link notes, a sword is a sword is a sword is a sword, and a stick is just as much of a stand-in as any kind of sword we could choose. So there's an interchangeability, it just stands for a notion of sword, and that's largely true up until the 19th century, where this transition occurred, and you have a historically specific sword. So a King Lear in the 11th century is going to have an 11th century sword. Um, a modern production is going to have a modern sword, and that's how we train and certify actors today in historically specific and martially specific movement patterns um, that often culturally erase alternatives or folk traditions. Um, 
The Carnusers helped set the terms for actor training and practical execution in 19th century Britain, helped teach audiences how to read staged combat, and we still have those conversations today about action movies where we'll discuss how an orc is doing something right. <laughs> an orc can't do it right. There's no orc. Um, and they forwarded an epistemologic, uh, epistemology of mimetic violence within historic and cultural context that we still use, but which embodies Victorian class values, body aesthetics, and colonial cultural bias. On this last note, my interest in the Carnusers has been amplified by their similarities with some trends in American politics in the last 10 years or so. Specifically, the section of political masculinity that frames our American origin story as inseparable from our relationship to guns uses that narrative to justify the necessity, training, and presentation of arms as a defining national and masculine trait and seems to need to invent external threats in order to support an ideological construction of threatened masculinity that needs to be armed, invulnerable, and simultaneously threatening. So again, enforcing itself outward. The ideals the Carnusers embodied did not survive the realities of the First World War. The club closed down in 1922 for lack of new members or interest. And I suspect the intent of this conference was to explore the ways in which bodies are sites of resistance to physical and cultural hegemony. The Carnusers are a study in how regimes of embodiment are created in the first place, and how gender norms can get trapped within the fantasy of political necessity. And I want to close by looking back at that very first recitation that Henry Irving did back in 1895. And that night he did a presentation of Thomas Hood's The Dream of Eugene Aram, uh, which was a story of an intellectual, uh, a school teacher, who was unable to overcome the violent passions inside him and murders his faithless wife. Um, and then buries the body after having this sort of struggled relationship about whether to drown it, which he first does, fishes out the body after it washes up, then buries it again, but has this continued relationship to the effects of what he's done. So there is this sort of tension in this ironic choice that Irving made of the tension between a, a sort of scholar and the underlying violent passion. Um, and I think it's sort of interesting that he chose that to present to these academic scholars who were changing the way we looked at the violent male body itself. So there we go. Thank you.